I loved it. I send you a copy. Bam! Bitch went down. Welcome back to Horror Queers. We're talking horror comedy queer stuff. And I'm Joe. And I'm Trace. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. So we are talking about Cemetery Man. It is from 1994, but of course it didn't debut stateside until 1995. And uh, actually, 1996. Right. So <laughs> this is a fish. Well, okay. So listeners, uh, I fucked up a little bit. So this is the 25th anniversary of Cemetery Man, also uh, known as De La Morte De La More, and um, literally everywhere that's not the United States, and I guess Canada, because is it Cemetery Man over there for you too? I believe it is, but yeah, you'll see people use it interchangeably. Yeah, but <laughs> the movie premiered in March of 94 in Italy, and then it premiered in the U.S. in April of 96. So this episode's coming out in April. <laughs> so I basically got the date of the U.S. premiere, like the month and the day, but then I mixed it up with the year from Italy. My bad. So uh, happy late 25-year anniversary, Cemetery Man. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you don't look a day over 24. It looks old. Although, granted, this movie's not available on Blu-ray. I had to buy a DVD for this. And it... I don't know. There's something about the way this movie looks that turns me off. But we'll get into it more. I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a fan of this aesthetic. And I don't know if it's just because of the age or if it's because of the way it was shot or filmed or what. But something about this movie I had a lot of trouble connecting with. But it has, as we'll discuss, a pretty loyal and... I want to say a sizable cult following. Mm -hmm. Although if you're listening to this, I'm assuming you're in that cult because uh, I, I don't know. I feel like not a lot of people have seen or maybe even heard of this movie. So many assumptions in those first two minutes. I know. Uh, yeah, I mean, by the, by all means, though, if you're listening and you haven't seen it, you're in for a treat because there's a lot of uh, fun, crazy stuff that happens in this movie. Yeah, bunch of bad shit stuff. Yes, absolutely. So yeah, um, anyway, so we are talking about Cemetery Man, and that's what I'm going to call it for the rest of the episode. We're going to go with that? Sure. Okay. Uh, again, released in the U.S. on April 26, 1996, by October Films, with a budget of $4 million. And I will say that for $4 million, like the, the movie does put it to good use, especially in the practical effects department. Mm-hmm. And you got a runtime of 105 minutes. I didn't have an opening weekend rank because apparently <laughs> this movie only grows $253,969 uh, in its entire U.S. theatrical run, which adjusted would be a little over $400,000 today. Still bad. Oh, it's super bad. But uh, I'm a little perplexed. Did you do a lot of research on the release for this film? I, I didn't really understand what... I mean, I guess maybe it was the subject matter and the fact that it was an Italian production. Yeah, so I watched the special feature on my DVD. I have the Anchor Bay DVD that is out of print, mm -hmm. and it's got a 30-minute extra feature interview with a bunch of the people from behind the scenes, and they talk about the release, and they, they don't say why, like they don't speculate, but they acknowledge that it was a huge colossal flop in the US, and it was apparently a big, massive success in Italy, which is really... They were trying to make it for an Italian market, well, but they, they seemed very, very disgruntled that it didn't succeed in the U.S. Well, I mean, that's the thing, too, though, is, you know, this movie premiered in Italy two years before it even made its way to the States. And so I'm guessing that disgruntlement is probably from the fact that they were preparing for the U.S. release for two years. Maybe. I mean, this is the kind of film that was always going to have a challenging release strategy, as we've talked about a couple of times on the podcast, horror comedies don't always sync up with audiences. They can be a bit of a hard sell. And this one is also not a straightforward zombie film. Like, when you look at the advertising of it, it makes it seem like it's a guy who shoots a lot of zombies in the head. And that does happen a lot. But it's also deeply philosophical and all about life and death. And that that's not going to go over as well for people who are looking for something a little bit more straightforward and mainstream yeah i mean th th there's definitely a lot more on this movie's mind than in something like say dead alive uh which that's a movie that this movie reminds me of a lot at least <laughs> i'm gonna use the word aesthetics a lot in this episode mm -hmm. but it reminded me of that and as we've discussed before 
Dead Alive is not my cup of tea, nor is Italian horror, <laughs> for that matter. Yeah. So, so this is like a double whammy of bad for you. Yeah, and I mean, I didn't like hate it. I mean, so I just watched it a second time tonight. I watched it two nights ago, and then I watched it again right before we recorded this to try to see if I missed something, because so many people I know like it, and I was like, maybe I missed it. I don't know. Like, I want to like this movie, because everyone else likes it, but it didn't connect with me, but that, that Dead Alive connection is definitely a part of it. And I can totally see, like, with these philosophical, you know, musings that it has, you know, American audiences aren't going to latch onto it, on top of the fact that it's already kind of a goofy horror comedy. Mm -hmm. So, uh, the reviews were mildly positive at the time. You're looking at 63% on Rotten Tomatoes with an audience score of 78%. Metacritic has no data on this movie, so, I mean, make of that what you will. I will say that the only reason I had heard of this movie before we recorded is because I have one of the... it's. Those mini books that you find in a bookstore where it's like 101 horror movies you have to see before you die. Oh, yes. And it's it's lodged in between Candyman and Scream. That's the only reason I knew what this movie was. Hmm. I knew it because of Rupert Everett. Which, rent listeners, in case you didn't know, <laughs> we'll try to kind of find a queer reading in this movie, which I think it's possible. But the main reason for talking about this is that, yes, this movie has Rupert Everett who was arguably one of the more well-known, like, gay male actors in, well, maybe not anymore. <laughs> no, but definitely at the time, he was one of the only confirmed out actors, and he often talked publicly about how being out hurt his career. Yes, specifically, because he came out, and I did some research on that, he came out in 1989, because he, he had a pretty good career in the 80s in Hollywood, but he mentioned how after he came out in 89, he had the hardest time getting cast in a Hollywood picture, which I'm sure is yeah. what led him to this movie. Well, that, and I'm sure he was actively recruited because of his likeness, which you'll talk about in a moment. Okay. But, you know, obviously, as I'm sure you know, he hit a career resurgence in 1997 with My Best Friend's Wedding. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to run through this cast and crew really quick. Mm -hmm. But I already forgot how to pronounce the director's name, even though you told me earlier. <laughs> so, so, is it McKaylee? Yeah. Oh, fuck yeah. It's spelled like Michelle. It's McKaylee, either Suave, like Rico Suave, but like Italian, or Suave. I think Suave. Yeah, sure. So, McKaylee Suave. There you go. He directed a film that I love called Stage Fright, not the one we reviewed a couple weeks ago. <laughs> 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 but, but the good 1987 slasher film with an owl masked killer stage right and that's a really 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 good movie never seen it i don't know if we'll ever cover it on this podcast but i would recommend you check it out i think it's a slasher that's aged particularly well from the 80s because as much as i love a lot of 80s slashers i don't think a lot of them have aged well and this one has all right Suave uh, co-wrote the script with Gianni Romoli, and Gianni Romoli wrote a book that this movie's based on. Any comic book readers out there, they're going to know him as the author of the comic book's Dylan Dog, uh, which mm -hmm. I've, I've never read, and I have not seen the movie adaptation, <laughs> even though I heard it's terrible. Yes, that one starts another out gay man, coincidentally. Brandon Rouse not out. Oh, okay. I guess... Another poorly kept secret, then. Wait, is this... Are you being serious? Dude, yeah, he slept with Brian Singer. No, he did not. He okay, did okay. not. Okay, sure. No, first of all, if he's gay, that's awesome. He's on Legend of Tomorrow, and I love him. Okay. What? <laughs> Wait, I've literally never heard this before. When he made Superman Returns, yeah. I was under the impression that that was, like, a big to-do. Okay. Not because he made the film, because of how he got the role. Okay. I could be wrong. I could be just, you know, doing that Richard Gere gerbil story. I think you Perhaps. are, but 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 you're having me question me now, because I feel like that I've Googled, you know, is Brandon Routh gay? <laughs> I feel like your search history is just filled with those kinds of inquiries. Is blah 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 gay, blah 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 full frontal, blah 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 dick shot, like totally. That's all my search history. My husband really is into it. <laughs> it's your fetish <laughs> yes it is also because apparently he's um ralph has a really big penis so you know good good for him mm -hmm. <laughs> and then yeah i mean honestly like that's kind of it you know you have rupert everett is your lead francesco della morte which is where the original title comes from della morte in italian i believe means of death mm -hmm. 
And then in the movie, it's it's uh, revealed that his mother's maiden name was Delamore, which is of love. So the literal translation of the of the movie's title is of death of love, which the movie yeah. kind of deals with those two things primarily. <laughs> You gotcha. Which is why it's probably a better title than Cemetery Man, although Cemetery Man is obviously easier to sell and easier for North Americans to understand. Oh, yeah. North Americans are going to go see a movie called Della Morte, Della More. They, they can't pronounce that shit. I just did a fantastic job, though, so thank you. Unless we find out that it's actually Della Morte, Della More, in which no. case we... <laughs> no, 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 because on my rewatch today, he literally stands in front of a grave and goes, Della Morte, Della More. All right, then. So... If I said it wrong, Rupert Everett said it wrong. I almost said Richard Gere. <laughs> <laughs> we shall refer to him as Richard Gere for the rest of the episode. Oh, my God. So, yeah. Um, and honestly, your only other main players, um, it's Anna Fauci as she. Because she plays, like, four different characters in this movie, but none of them have a name. No. That's very purposeful, though. I'm sure it is, and I'm sure you'll tell me what it is. And that actually sounded really bitchy, and I didn't mean for it to come across that way. <laughs> I'm actually looking forward to what the explanation for this is. And then I'm also going to butcher this name, but it is Francois Haji Lazaro as a uh, Nagi, who is Francesco's, I'm going to use the phrase simple-minded, simple-minded mm-hmm. assistant. Yes. Others have said he is mentally handicapped or he is slow. Slow. Great word. And... He can only say the word na, and that is G-N-A, or I guess nya, nya, nya. No, na. Na? All right. That's it. I mean, that's literally all I have in this movie. So what's it about, Joe? All right. This is, uh, this is one of those films that defies a simple plot recap, so. I can't wait to see what you have to say. (laughs) Francesco Della Morte, Rupert Everett, is the cemetery caretaker in the small Italian town of Buffalora. He lives on the premises surrounded by death with only his mentally handicapped or slow assistant, Nagi, Francois Haji Lazaro. Is that what we agreed on? Sure. Sure. For company. I'm never saying the name again. I'm just saying Nagi. The Latin inscription over the Buffalo Cemetery gate reads Resurrectoris for those who will rise again. And Della Morte regularly kills the dead whom he nicknames Returners when they rise from the grave on the seventh night following their death. He tries to tell the mayor, Stefano Mascarelli, but the man <laughs> is too fixated on his campaigning and Della Morte is afraid of losing his job. At a funeral, Della Morte falls in love with she, Anna Falci, a young widow of a rich elderly man. Well consummating their marriage by her husband's grave, the husband rises and bites her. She seemingly dies from the bite, and when she rises, Della Morte shoots her, only to later discover that she was not actually dead and must be put down again, but only after she bites him. From this point on, Della Morte seems to lose his grip on reality. He sees a visage of death who encourages him to kill the living instead, and he murders a group of teens in town who have spread the rumor that he is impotent. He also lusts after she in two other forms, the mayor's new secretary and a sex worker backpacker. As the body count piles up, Della Morte's best friend Franco, Anton Alexander, takes credit for the murders around town, but fails to recognize Della Morte when he visits him in the hospital. Finally fed up with his lot at the cemetery, Della Morte and Nagi pack up and leave town, but discover that the road leads to nowhere. When he attempts to kill them both, Nagi stops him with a full sentence instead of his typical nah. And as the two characters swap vocal mannerisms, they are revealed to be miniature figures inside the snow globe on Della Morte's desk. Which, by the way, I forgot. Again, I realized it on a rewatch. The movie opens with that snow globe. Mm-hmm. A little rose buddy. Yes. Uh, I actually do have to correct myself, though. So I actually said that Gianni uh, Romoli uh, wrote the Dylan Dog comics. He just co-wrote the script with McKaylee. Dylan Dog and like the, the book that this is based on is actually written by Tiziano Sclavi. Ah, okay. And I probably butchered that too. But in case y'all were yelling at me over Joe's plot recap. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I'm Cemetery Man. I don't know. You know how I feel about it. You know, I'm, I'm kind of firmly in like the, eh, it's fine. I see why people like it, but it, it really wasn't for me category. What were your thoughts on it? So this was interesting. I, I mentioned to you before we began that I wondered whether this was the best film for both of us to go in having not watched beforehand. Mm-hmm. If only because it is a rather dense film. You've mentioned the aesthetics a couple of times and the film, it's really jam packed with some really striking visual imagery. The plot, however, is 
very surreal. It's almost hallucinatory. If you're someone who likes a very plot heavy film or something that's puts a nice pin in it at the end, this is not a good film for you. So watching it as a first time watch and trying to pay attention while also trying to make sense of it was not the easiest experience. I think I liked it a lot more than you, but I also feel like I don't have a good handle on it. And I can understand why people like it because it's got a lot of striking stuff to it. But I feel like I need to watch it again. Like, I'm actually impressed that you watched it a second time because I think you'll probably be able to recall sequences and certain things a lot more vividly than me. That's actually a really good point, though, because I, on a rewatch, and granted, I was cooking while I was watching it. So, I mean, I was paying attention because, like, not as much as I was the first time, but there were parts of this movie that on a second viewing, I was like, oh, right, I forgot that happened. And it's not because I wasn't paying attention the first time. I think it's just because you're trying to absorb so much the first time of, like, what is happening in this movie. Particularly in that second half when the shit really goes off the rails and things get crazy and weird. Yes, I, th I think the turning point is whenever she rises from the dead and she's all, like, poison ivy, like, planted out. And he has to kill her again and he realizes that he actually killed her the first time rather than, like, killed her undead self. I think that is the turning point for the film when it starts mm -hmm. becoming... Something beyond just, oh, people rise from the dead seven days after they die and he kills them and it's funny. Ha ha. That's when it becomes more like, oh, this is like about it's like a character study about this mm -hmm. man who he's so lonely and is obsessed with the idea of love and then doesn't know how to handle death because death isn't permanent in his life. Well, yeah, and so much of this film takes place on a single set, and mm -hmm. this is a real cemetery. It's a desecrated cemetery that they shot in over 12 weeks in the fall and winter in Italy, some random backwoods town, and a lot of the film takes place just on the cemetery, so you get the impression that Francesco has not really lived a life, right? Like, right. He needs to keep his job. He's got this one friend who literally doesn't say anything to him. And then he's got this other friend, Franco, that he talks to on the phone regularly. But it's not like a give and take kind of relationship. So apart from his job, he's not really living. Like you can tell that he wants to do more, but it's almost like he's living in purgatory. Right. And that changes when he meets she. And that's why I think he falls so hard and so fast for her, like to the point of obsession. I, and then when he realizes that he's killed her, perhaps accidentally, and then he has to kill her again, or rather Nagi kills her. I think that's when everything just goes to shit and he loses his mind. And I'm not like criticizing this aspect of the movie because the movie's so over the top that it, you just kind of have to go with it and i noticed it more in a second viewing that it might have like been harder for me to digest his immediate like infatuation with her i just don't buy into it describing it how you just did though it makes more sense i was more fascinated with her all of her characters had some kind of like i don't want to say problem but maybe even like a kink yep she was obsessed with the ossuary which i had to google because i didn't know what it was <laughs> Mm -hmm. Well, it's not a very common term. Uh, no. So what is it for people who don't know? Basically, it's a, it's a place where human skeletal remains are stored or kept. Yeah, it's like an above ground catacombs or a crypt with lots of skeletons. Lots of skeletons. So the first she has that, which I mean, yeah, one of her versions uh, has a fear of penetration. Mm -hmm. of That's boners. the mayor secretary. Yes. Then there's like the the young the prostitute who, I mean, I, I guess if we're going to call it that, we'll just say that her quote-unquote issue is that she's a prostitute, even though I'm not criticizing the act of sex work. It's, you know, great. But that's like her, you know, trait. Well, it's definitely the thing that he does not respond well to because yeah, he, kills he her. thought that they had a genuine connection. And then when he finds out about it, she doesn't even say anything. It's her bitchy roommate who's like, mm, yeah. you want to stay the night? That's going to cost you. Oh, she said she loves you? Mm, that's going to cost you. And then yeah. he's like, okay, well, I'm just going to burn this building down with you in it. <laughs> Which, okay, so for me, though, I'm like, okay, he puts a bed heater like under her sheets or he puts a heater under her sheets, which slowly catch on fire. I'm like, A, you're going to wake up from that. B, you have time to get out. But, you know, whatever. It's a movie. I don't think this is a movie that lends itself well to that level of... No, like, no Is this no. a accurate depiction of a realistic event? You may also notice that he only seems to shoot people in the head. And he is accurate to the point of never missing. Yeah. 
Like at one point he shoots a corpse through the head and also shoots the girl behind the oh, corpse in the head. I do I noticed that too, and I was like, that angle doesn't fully line up. It does not, but it makes for a great shot. It does. It is really good. And that, that actually reminds me, we can wait before we really dive into it, but I really want to talk about the female roles in this film. Yeah. Are they Italian? <laughs> Are they misogynistic? <laughs> Who could say? Going on like the, the comedy first. Sure. I do wonder if maybe there's kind of, at least for me, a cultural barrier on like, you know, what a specific culture finds funny as opposed to me. Because, you know, Dead Alive is uh, New Zealand. This is Italian. Maybe I only find American. Well, no, I'm sorry. That's not true. Because I like Shaun of the Dead. <laughs> and granted, this feels like a precursor to Shaun of the Dead in uh, a lot of ways, even mm-hmm. though. Like we've said, like, I do think this movie has a lot more on its mind than Shaun of the Dead, which is a lot more um, just, you know, a fun yeah. comedy. That's a straightforward. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but I just I don't know. Like, is there something about the Italians? Because watching it again, there were a lot of lines where I was like, oh, like if this was delivered in a different way, I would find this funny. When, when that girl who gets shot through the head, you know, when she's like, he's only eating me. Anyone can eat me if I say so, or like something like that. Like, obviously, it's a double mm-hmm. entendre for, you know, cunnilingus. Saying it a lot in my head, I was like, oh, that is funny. But the way it was delivered and the way it was filmed, I didn't think it was funny. So I don't know if maybe it, it's a thing on the director or if it's a thing with, like, the bad dubbing. Because ev- literally everyone except Rupert Everett was dubbed in this movie. <laughs> yeah. Or what it is, but, like, none of these jokes landed for me. And the only reason I upped my score in a second viewing is because I knew that on paper they are funny. But watching them, I didn't find them funny. Yeah, it's a little bit tricky because I think the comparative films that you mentioned, like Shaun of the Dead and even Dead Alive, a.k.a. Brain Dead, those films really lean into visual sight gags, which I think is a little bit it's also a little bit more commonplace for North American humor. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've talked before about how I find humor incredibly subjective. It's why it is. when people say, you know, like, give me a good comedy recommendation. I'm like, no, I will not. Because I find a lot of North American comedy not to my taste. But mm-hmm. I really love British comedy. And this is a bit more in the television realm than in the North American realm. But mm-hmm. or sorry, in the film realm. But one of the interesting things about this film is that it mixes the occasional sight gag with really dry, sardonic wit. Like Rupert Everett is well, yeah, I was gonna say really, really <laughs> funny, but he's not wisecracking. It's almost like morose joke cracking. Yeah. This. Well, no, I mean, a, a lot of the humor that does work, I think, is a testament to him and his performance. Because, yeah, dry wit is what I was thinking as I was watching it the second time. Like, there's a scene near the end of the film where he shot three people in quick succession in the hospital. And it's almost farcical where people keep coming in and being like hey you can't be doing that in here and he's just like and shoots them in the head (laughs) yeah i mean the the movie opens up with that yeah yeah which i think is a great opener this is who the character is he's almost like a wisecracking gumshoe but it's also really somber and just melancholy but coming back to that end scene he's walking out in this gorgeous mirrored spiral staircase Mm -hmm. and the police investigator who's kind of inept and stupid peeks his head over the railing and he's like hey where are you going there's been a bunch of murders you need to be careful and rupert everett's like it's fine whatever and the cop goes oh okay you've got a gun it's fine you should be able to protect yourself and it's like moments after he just said like there's a maniac in the hospital with a gun yeah well because and no one no one suspects him (laughs) no And you're like, it's funny, but it's not funny at the same time. And a lot of the comedy I found in the film was kind of like that, where you're like, "Uh uh-huh. I will say the one time that I actually laughed out loud, and the only time in the movie that I did, is when he shot that nun in the face. Well, you love a good nun in the face. I do love a good nun in the face. And I think it's a combination of just what what is happening. Like, like she runs in and is like, oh, you can't be doing this. And he just doesn't even blink and just shoots her in the face. Mm -hmm. It's cut very quickly. Maybe that's also more of an American thing. I don't know. But even like the next one, the doctor then comes in and he's like, oh, what is she doing on the floor? And Rupert Everett's like, she's praying. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that's true. You know, Suave was kind of, I don't want to say a protege, but he took a lot of inspiration and like worked with Dario Argento. 
Oh, yeah. In the special features on the DVD that I watched, he calls it the Italian Horror School. So I wonder if people who worked under Argento, it's kind of like the Italian equivalent of working under Roger Corman in the States. Maybe. I've only found one Argento movie that I've been uh, that I've really like enjoyed. Oh and gosh, it's here we go. Bring on the hate mail. And it's not Suspiria. Granted, there I, it is. <laughs> but but I have learned to appreciate Suspiria more on each viewing, and I've seen Suspiria three times. Not for lack of trying. You can't deny that. Like, if I don't like a movie, I'm, and I feel like I should like it, I'm going to try to. I'm going to watch it again. I'm going to do research on it to try to maybe understand, you know, what people like about it, and also maybe what I don't like about it. Suspiria. Mm-hmm. The complaints I have with it are, I think they're commonplace. It's you. You feel yeah. like there isn't enough plot, and it's style over substance. Yeah, but, you know, there are other movies where there are stellar receptions that doesn't annoy me as much as that. But, you know, I saw Deep Red for the first time recently. Wasn't crazy about it. I'm not big on Suspiria. I do like Tenebrae. Mm -hmm. And this isn't Argento, obviously. This is uh, Bava. But I love Demons. And I I enjoy Demons, too. But that's kind of the extent of Italian cinema. And so I obviously have to do a deeper dive into that genre of film, I guess. Because, I mean... I know it's like weird to call Italian horror a genre, but it's very specific. <laughs> well, yeah, it's almost like a national subgenre in that way, but it really does have an aesthetic all to its own because there's a bunch of Italian films that have nothing to do with Giallo and all yeah. that kind of stuff. So it makes sense. And maybe that's why I like Demons because yeah, I mean, obviously Giallo is a slasher film and they have very specific things that, you know, that can point them out. It's a killer with black gloves. <laughs> Well, there's maybe a little more to it than that. <laughs> there is, but but that's a good signifier. Is it from Italy? Is there a serial killer? Is he wearing black gloves? Uh, probably a giallo, which is why I've gotten in trouble for calling Suspiria a giallo before because it doesn't. It's not technically it's a giallo. Not really, no. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Anyway. So, but th- there are those stylistic and aesthetic qualities that those films possess that are evident in Cemetery Man, and it's just something that for some reason my brain just doesn't want to give in to are you thinking of anything in particular because i'm trying to reconcile what you're saying i don't know i mean i i keep going back to the delivery but then i also attribute the delivery to the dubbing Mm. i'm not gonna lie this dubbing is a hard watch like i hate dubbed movies as soon as it began and i saw the first dubbed actor i immediately went back to the menu and looked to see whether or not i could watch it in italian Italian. with english subtitles and the option was not there (laughs) I was so mad. I know. I. It sounds so... Like, I, I don't want to sound like a basic bitch, but I, I really do think I have trouble with dubbing. Like, a lot. Oh, I don't think that makes you basic. I think that actually raises your film cue. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean... People who are settling for dubbing, you're settling. Try to seek out subtitles. But that's a trait of Italian cinema, though, is that it's like Italian like horror and giallo and stuff like that. But then I'm also conflicted because demons has a lot of dubbing it doesn't really bother me i mean it's it stands out anyway but i I think that is a reason why i i don't connect as much with italian cinema because it is so reliant on dubbing but nevertheless there are things that i like about this movie and it's specifically i enjoy the effects of this movie i think the gore it's not an overtly like super gory movie but the practical effects work is very well done Mm -hmm. and i do like rupert ever's performance Yeah, I mean, if watching zombies get their heads blown off is kind of your deal, this is a pretty good movie for that. And it's a variety of different kinds of zombies, too, which is always fun. Yeah, I also particularly found enjoyable when the one zombie, uh, when he rises from the grave and he bursts out on his motorcycle that I guess he was buried with. (laughs) Yes, I love that. I mean, the whole sequence that led up to that is just so patently ridiculous, right? That, to me, was when the film took a turn into some really weird, absurd territory. Because Francesco is with Nagi, and they're having lunch with the mayor and the mayor's underage daughter. And Nagi falls in love with her, because all these characters just immediately fall in love with everybody. Yes, they do. And... His response to falling in love and being infatuated with this girl, who is surprisingly pleasant, considering that there's a larger, older gentleman looking very intently at her. Hey, you're right. She's very pleasant, but this is also, well, I was like, this is the 70s, but it's 1994 mm-hmm. um, or 93. But she's like, Daddy, can we buy him? 
Yeah. Like, <laughs> come There's on. There's a little bit of commentary about the rich. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. I mean, we're also talking about a man who later, after discovering that his daughter is dead, talks about taking a photo op with her in her glass coffin so that he can get reelected. <laughs> I did enjoy that. And then, of course, it's not even a reveal because you know her head is missing. But when they, like, unveil the corpse and he's like, what's wrong here? And Rupert Everett just goes, meh, and, yeah, like, shrugs. Like, ah, I got nothing for you. <laughs> uh, see, though, I'm laughing talking about it. I didn't laugh, like, when it happened. <laughs> but I kind of feel like that's the power of this film. It kind of sticks with you. And then when you think back to it, you're like, oh, you know what? That was enjoyable. Or that visual was amazing. Okay, yeah. so Nagi gets so excited about this girl. He ends up projectile vomiting on her. Ugh. And she's just kind of like, bah. And then this guy shows up on a motorcycle who I had to look at the Wikipedia page to find out is her boyfriend. And yeah, he's just like, hey, what happened? And she's like, this guy threw up on me. And he's like... Cool. Get on. <laughs> Get on. <laughs> and she's like, I knew you'd understand. And then she yeah. just drives off. And I'm like, your dress is covered in vomit. vomit. But And her dad's obviously- like, oh, kids this days, or like the 1994 equivalent of that saying. So they're driving around with his pack of friends on mo- on motorcycles, and they're taking these turns really, really fast. And then they end up getting crushed under the wheels of a bus carrying Boy Scouts that then drives off of a cliff. <laughs> so we end up getting this kid on his motorcycle. He's buried with it. And he bursts out of the grave on it like a fucking meatloaf and bat out of hell. And mm-hmm. then we've also got Rupert Everett shooting a half dozen Boy Scouts in the face. It, it all pays off. Like literally everyone that dies in this movie, like they come back and not just like, oh, like they're going to come back. They all get their own resurrection scene. So, yeah, you got your Boy Scouts. You got the boyfriend. Oh, because that's the other thing. You know, there's this subplot with this Valentina, who's the mayor's daughter, her biker boyfriend, has another girlfriend who's also a biker Mm -hmm. who goes to his funeral and, like, drapes herself over his grave because she, like, wants to know that he wanted her instead. So when he does rise from the dead, she lets him eat her because it proves that he loved her instead of Valentina. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's messed up. It's messed up. And again, it's something that I feel like maybe if it had been done differently, I would find it well, whatever. I'm, I'm not going to talk about why I didn't find things funny because I've hit the nail on the head too many times with that. You know, it, it is what it is. But it is funny. Talking about it, it is funny. Yeah, I called it absurd before. And I'll, I'll say that again, because so much of what happens in this film, you're just like, wait, what? Like, what is happening right now? It's a very kooky. It's a little slapsticky at points. But then undermining it at every turn is this dry as fuck performance by Rupert Everett, where he's just like, so over everything. He's just like, Oh my god, it's another person to put down. Like he's well, never phased by any of the zombies. You know what it kind of reminded me of? It kind of reminded me, and I'm pretty sure this came after this movie, but it was kind of like clerks, but Italian with Rupert Everett and zombies. Cause when he's like, I wasn't even supposed to be here today. Like that's kind of what it reminded me of. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. That's actually not a bad comparison. It's very much that, like, I'm over this shit kind of attitude. Mm-hmm. Because you get the impression throughout, and I think he even says it a couple times, he doesn't want to do this job. He doesn't want to have this life. He feels But like he doesn't want to lose, he doesn't want to lose a job security either, because whenever something happens, he's like, no, it's my job. Like, I have to do this. Yeah. Yeah. And rather than, like, tell the world about the zombies that are coming out of the grave... He just keeps killing them, so he still has a job. Because if he tells the world, then he doesn't have a job. He's also dealing with the rumor of his impotence, which is kind of a thing that's mentioned, but yep. is There's there... Even a weird hallucinatory scene where he goes to the doctor so that he can actually get his penis removed so that he will not be driven by sexual urges. But then he also... Wait, To no, do no, no, that, no. He, he also has to prove that he has a functioning penis. So he just drops trow in front of the doctor and is like, look at my dick. Now, see, I thought that he was doing that because that was when he was with the version of she who had a phobia of erections and penetration. So I thought he was doing that so he could be with her. Well, I mean, yes, but also if you want to read into his interactions with the various versions of she, mm-hmm. he's like a child. 
one of the things that I read interpreting the film is this idea that he's almost like a man child. And that's why he also keeps falling in love with these different iterations of her is because he's kind of like a horny teenager. So he's just driven by his sexual urges all the time. And that's nicely contrasted by Nagi, who is seemingly the only one who can actually form a legitimate romantic relationship. Which is why he's able to have, you know, a bit of a a cute thing with Valentina's head in his television set. I did love the scene whenever her dad finds her head and he's like, Valentina, why are you in the TV? Why are you on TV? (laughs) Why are you on TV? It was very like, like, it was very, (laughs) it was like Willy Wonka. (laughs) A little bit. Yeah. Now, do you think that he's seeing she as all these different people? So do you think that, you know, it's just happenstance or do you think it's like it's in his brain? These obviously aren't the same woman, or they they don't look alike, actually. It's just him projecting her image onto these random women. I think you could read it either way. And I think that's actually the reason why she doesn't have a name. Mm -hmm. Because she is a projection of all of these idealized fantasy women. So he sees her, and he's infatuated with her. He doesn't even care to know about her. Like, he's showing her around the ossuary, and she's making these comments about how beautiful it is, and... Has she always dreamed of being in a place like this? And he's just staring at her tits and her ass the whole time. (laughs) Yeah. And, you know, we talked about how after he kills her, he basically goes crazy. So at that point, when he's meeting other versions, it could be that these women look nothing like her and he's projecting. Or it could be that this is all fantasy and none of it is actually happening anymore. So what do we think of Fauci? Um... It's an interesting performance. Okay, so she was a supermodel before this, Mm -hmm. a very, very famous Italian supermodel. And in the DVD special, they have an interview with her and she talks about how modeling bored her. So that's why she turned to acting because she wanted something that was more challenging. She did a television commercial with Fellini his last thing that he made before he died and it skyrocketed her. Like, she became super, super fucking famous, and then she got this movie. And the reason she took it is because she got to play three completely different performances. Mm -hmm. I do think she's good, but I actually don't also think that the movie asks much of her. Like, she's meant to be stunningly gorgeous and sexually alluring. And she does that Mm -hmm. well, but she's also... She's she. She's not a character. Yeah, she's a blank slate. And... In my notes, I have in all caps, her nipples are huge. Yeah, she's a bit of a baloney barb, and I feel bad about saying that. I wanted to bring this up. So I, I did do some looking at some reviews, because again, I was trying to figure you out what people liked say about this movie. You spent some time looking at pictures. At her boobs. <laughs> <laughs> no, so I mean, because... Th- Is Fulci's boobs normal? <laughs> <laughs> again describing this movie it sounds so demented because th- the whole thing is like, you know okay she's a widow and francesco sees her and he falls in love immediately mm-hmm. and then she's like no i don't want to be with you i love my husband and then he's like oh there's a huge ossuary here and then she goes an ossuary oh let's go see it and then she gets all boned up yeah and then a skeleton grab oh i did love this though when the skeleton grabs her and it like pulls off her clothes it's rapey it's like skeleton rapey Yes, and then she, like, runs out, like, with half her shirt turned off, and she's like, ah! <laughs> so, okay, I'm talking about it, and I'm thinking about the visual, and it's funny. I just didn't laugh at the time. I'm telling you, man, this movie creeps up on you. So, there's that. Um, but anyway, so then she stays in the graveyard, and they fuck on her dead husband's grave, and her tits are just out this entire time. Yeah, it doesn't look like the most comfortable sex that you've ever had, no. but it is framed beautifully. She's on top of him on the gravestone, and mm-hmm. it's like full moon right behind her. Yeah. There's so much gorgeousness here. There's a shot of their heads as they kiss, like before they actually start like penetrating uh, where it's like their heads in front of the moon. It's like a nice silhouette. Mm-hmm. Oh, actually, before you go too much further, I did want to jump back to their first kiss yeah. in the Ossiary. Sure. Because, A, the set in that is amazing. It's got a low ceiling, and the floor is actually ankle-deep water. It looked very yeah. Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade when they had to go into the into the catacombs. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I can totally see that. 
But yeah, like the set is amazing and she's wearing a black veil and like a skin tight black dress. And he goes to lift the veil and says he wants to kiss her. And she's like, no, we have to do it this way. And she pulls out a yeah. red <laughs> silk scarf and puts it over his face. And I just wanted to reinforce just the fact that this film totally fucking knows what it's doing in terms of shot composition and aesthetic. So their kiss is literally a reenactment of a painting called The Lovers by René Magritte. He's the same guy who did the image of a pipe that says, Ceci n'est pas une pipe. Sure. You're like, no, you don't get it, but that's fine. I don't know anything of what you're saying, but go ahead. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm intrigued. <laughs> I mean, A, I love that entire sequence, but the moment that they kiss, so it looks like they're wrapped in death shrouds, and it was just really visually captivating. And then to see that it's a direct reference to this painting from 1928, which is apparently quite a famous painting. It's in mm -hmm. the MoMA in New York City. And I was like, that's really cool, but it's from the surrealist period as well. So you're kind of like, ah, it's even appropriate for what the film is trying to do, because the film is very surreal. Yeah, I mean, yeah. In any case, you can jump back now to the the fornication. I no, <laughs> I mean, I, just, I I I think I think that's I mean surreality, surreal, surrealism, surrealism. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, thank you. I was really struggling with that. I mean, that's art history shit, by the way. So no, no, no. I mean, by and I did not take art history. I remember yeah. that was in high school. That was like one of like the AP classes that you could take, and it was like super hard, and everyone failed it. <laughs> It's a lot of memorization. <laughs> yes. And I don't, I mean, well, that, that, thank you. That was interesting. But yeah, surrealism and me don't mix particularly well, which is why, again, something like Mandy, you know, it's like, I, I don't do well with it because it, it would probably take me multiple viewings. And so I have to be really willing to commit to it to like get into it. Yeah. Anyway. So yeah, Falchi, I think is fine, but she is a sex object in this movie. Yes. So. I was doing review research, and I found a couple um, excerpts from reviews from uh, men. Oh, right. Yeah, you mentioned <laughs> this. Ugh. So, most of these are from 2006, which is when the DVD came out. I guess it was first released on DVD, which is probably your out-of-print one. Yeah, quite possibly. So, the first one is from Arrow in the Head, which in their reviews, they have a TNA section. So, make of that what you will. In the TNA section, two words, guys, Anna and Falchi. The woman has a body to die for, and she showed it off with all kinds of melon shots and cheek-to-cheek -cheek shots. Oh, my God. <laughs> wow. Like, really? Wow. She should get that bod insured because it must be worth gold in the bedroom. And then it goes, the ladies get a thin and cut Rupert Everett showing off his pecs and buttocks. Like, <laughs> the, the one line. Gee. But Yeah. So then uh, there was something called HorrorNews.net. Whoever Adrian Halen is, uh, this is you. Yes, name them, shame them. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Actress Anna Falci is one to behold, bringing her incredible beauty to the delight of viewers and settling the screen on fire with a full frontal nude appearance. Okay, not as bad. But, like, do we need to bring up the full frontal nudity in the criticism? I mean, I'm saying that. I'm sure I've mentioned that in some one of my reviews before, so it could be hypocritical. But, anyway. Okay, so this is an interesting point. I'd love to do a quick mini sidebar with this because, yeah, as you know, we've had many exchanges about this. Any time that we bring up any kind of gratuitous nudity in mm -hmm. any of our reviews on Bloody Disgusting, we just get absolutely raked on the coals. I don't bring up gratuitous nudity. You do, and you get raked through the coals. But, um, yeah, yes, absolutely. I, I'm aware of that. <laughs> it's part of horror fandom it's a weird thing too i mean i think it's a little less prevalent in the 90s but certainly in the 80s and then again in the aughts when horror kind of went back mm -hmm. into it's like ooh, we're edgy and we're doing hard r's now yeah the weird ownership that certain parts of the fandom and i'm not gonna lie it's primarily heterosexual men yeah absolutely they feel like there's a sense of ownership over this idea that there should be female nudity gratuitous female nudity like don't just give me tits give me vag shots like they, they they view it as a as a trait of the genre yeah which to an extent yes but that doesn't mean like things change mm -hmm. <laughs> and i don't feel as strongly about gratuitous nudity as you do i don't mind it when it's in service of the story like i would argue that 
But yeah, but but then it's not gratuitous. Then it it, it works. So but, but your issue is though when it is gratuitous, and you run into issues with that because you're facing commenters who say, "Well, gratuity, whether it be nudity or violence, is a trait of the genre." Mm -hmm. Then I would throw this at you. Then so again, just playing devil's advocate. <laughs> you know, okay, gratuitous nudity is bad, but what about the gratuitous violence? See, I've never had an issue with gratuitous violence. Why is that? Well, to be honest, mostly because I don't think it demeans people. Gotcha. And you could argue that, you know, actors and actresses know what they're signing up for when they sign on to these films. I would counter with, that's actually not always true. <laughs> but mm -hmm. to me, if it's in service of the story, yes, by all means, have nudity where it makes sense. It's when people say, can we get away with this because we think it will engorge penises, then I'm not interested right. in it. Or take it full circle and say, cool, let's have gratuitous nudity, but from both sexes. Well, so then that that's my other question. And again, like, I'm on your side here. I really am. Oh, no, I know. So yeah, so what what if we had a horror movie where it was literally like just a bunch of gratuitous shots of penises? There were no boobs, no vagina, but it was just male gratuitous nudity. I love it. Would you have... Well, but, <laughs> but, but, but you see where a commenter, which again, it's these straight males, would have a problem with that because then you're being hypocritical. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, I would acknowledge it as ridiculous. And then I would probably say, wow, isn't this finally past due? Like, thank yeah. God we're finally getting to see some D in these films. And Which, it's funny, and, and, like, we just, we talked, you know, a couple of weeks back in the first minisode that we did for the Patreon, you reviewed a film out of South by Southwest where you said that there was equal dicks and, yeah. like, female nudity. Yeah. You know, it didn't make for a good film, but you said that it had a great kill involving a dick. Oh, yeah, yeah. But, well, and for that matter, none of it's really sexualized except for the female nudity. Uh, actually, no, it's a movie called Porno, and in the porno, like, there is a penis shot, but it's not like erect or anything. But, yeah, there, there, there's plenty of penises in that movie on top of vaginas and breasts. <laughs> but, no, I, I, I do get what you're saying. I understand and I agree. But, yeah, I, I think it is important to call it out and be like, it's gratuitous. It's not good. I think, though, where you run into problems is, though, is that you do come across as very harsh <laughs> on it. And I think there's maybe a more delicate way to... Eh, fuck it. No, there's not. Because honestly, you're not going to make those commenters on Bloody Disgusting happy. <laughs> no, it's true. <laughs> to the point where I now get people who write in my reviews, even if I haven't mentioned it, they're like, oh, well, maybe gratuitous nudity would have made it better or something like that. And I'm just like, okay, fuckers. Anyway, yeah. coming back to Cemetery Man, there is nudity in this movie, but I would argue that it is not gratuitous. Could I have done with a little more butt from Mr. Everett? Yeah, sure. Oh, that's what I was going to mention. Yeah. I mean, we get half of a butt shot and it's when he's in the doctor's office proving that he has a working penis. We don't even get any nudity from him in the sex scene. Uh, no, I think you can see his butt in part of the sex scene, but it's, it's I... brief. Yeah. I, was, I don't remember seeing it. Like, no, so you see his nipples and his chest a lot. Yeah. Like, ooh. They spent a good amount of budget keeping him wet looking i would say yes no when a uh, zombie tree she like bites his nipples and is like literally like, ooh, pulling them yeah. off Ooh, i was like dude i know you're in love with her but she is full-blown zombie she has twigs coming out of all parts of her body p.s makeup on that effect looked amazing no it was really good but like because i hey. I'm not into nipple play because I have very tiny, like, dime-sized nipples, and they're very <laughs> sensitive. And Okay, so no Jason X action for you. No, I don't want any metal pincers on my nips. But no, because I once was with this guy, and he was, like, going down hard with his teeth on my nipples. And I was like, this does not feel good. Anyway, not for me. If you're into nipple play, by all means, do it. Great. Send not trace fan so fiction. That's what he's saying. <laughs> But watching her, like, because she was biting hard and then pulling on those nipples. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, huh, huh. like, it was cringy for me. It, it was like a killing tendon. Movie for like, you. <laughs> it was. <laughs> Wait, okay, so, but I have two more review snippets um, about her boobs. Okay. So, <laughs> this is, uh, this is not a bad one. The last one I'm going to save is pretty fun. The, this is IGM, and it's Todd Gilchrist, who was actually written for Bloody Disgusting before recently and when i say recently i mean like in the past year but basically it's a positive review and it just goes uh you know he's talking about something positive blah 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 and the fact that it features a particularly buxom italian beauty who manages to disrobe several times in between bloody interludes doesn't hurt the film either so i would argue that's unnecessary you don't need to say it that. is well 
it's unnecessary. Now, here's my other one. Now, this is from a defunct website. I, I'm sorry, a now defunct website, but it's called Ozus's World Movie Reviews. So, it's a negative review, the only uh, negative review that I pulled. And it goes, this splatter film with weak satirical, political, and metaphysical ideas is really all about entertaining the viewer with its demented undertakings, such as its necrophilia and hallucinogenic visions. I'm sorry, what? I know. And that it does, to a certain degree, is about all it has going for it, other than letting us leer at those wonderful knockers of Falchi in whichever of the, the three roles she played. <laughs> Can we also talk about men's capacity to describe women's breasts? Knockers, I... <laughs> melons. In a review! <laughs> Are these written by 12-year-old boys? That's what I'm saying. I pulled these from Rotten Tomatoes. And half the reviews from Rotten Tomatoes, Um, again, the websites don't exist anymore. So it's like, you know, whatever. But these are the ones that I could find. And I'm like, it's a bad movie, but at least we get to leer at these wonderful knockers. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> Straight men, if you're listening to this, like, what the fuck? Yeah. What the fuck? Do better. Yeah, so I, I just felt like I had to bring those up. because, And I wanted to find more, and there probably are more out there. Because, again, her boobs are striking in this movie, and she has, what did you call them, balonies? I said baloney bar, which is a mean-spirited joke from Mean Girls. Oh, see, I had a, a straight guy in high school that would call them uh, just pepperoni nipples. Yeah, same idea. <laughs> Yes, same, same idea. But yeah, nevertheless, she was gorgeous, and she had enormous breasts, bazungas, uh, <laughs> knockers. <There> we go. <laughs> Tata, epic tatas. <laughs> yes. Uh, I just think boobs are such a... There's not like a not crude word for them. I mean, I guess breasts. Like, breasts is like totally fine. Yeah. But like every other word for them, it's just like, you can imagine like a five-year-old saying it and laughing. Mm -hmm. Yep, exactly. Anyway. So yeah... What do you think of Rupert Everett in this movie? I mean, we've kind of touched on him a bit, but um, did you want to bring up the reason for his casting? Oh, yeah. Okay, so this was really interesting to me because, like you, I had not heard of the source material. Mm -hmm. So I think I knew that it was based on something, but I didn't know what it was. Sorry, what's the name of the graphic novel again? Dylan Dog. Dylan Dog, thank you. So apparently Dylan Dog was super, super famous in Italy. And the character in that comic looks exactly like Rupert Everett because it was literally based on Rupert Everett. He didn't even know that it was. Uh... He found out about it after the fact. He realized that's why he was super famous in Italy because this thing was a massive success. So it's interesting that this film is based on the book, which was made after the uh, comic. So he's actually playing a character that's named after the guy from the book, but the character that he's really basing a lot of his performance in, even like many of the shots in the film, are taken directly from the graphic novel. That's interesting. I mean, because uh, like I mentioned at the beginning, I haven't seen the film adaptation of Dylan Dog. I've heard it's terrible. But, you know, it's Brandon Routh and like, you know, boner yeah he's a little bit of a walking cardboard at some points so no 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 no. if you're basing that on superman returns yes he is nothing in that movie but what well, have you seen zach and miri make a porno of course uh, he's so good in that but also uh in legends of tomorrow which you should really watch all of you should it's great he's super fun in that but um also, because I, I, I found this piece of trivia, an American company was willing to fund and distribute Cemetery Man if hmm. they cast Matt Dillon in the role. Oh, interesting. I can kind of see it. Yeah, but I guess no one wanted to cast Matt Dillon in this role. <laughs> but can you imagine how different of a movie it would have been? Because he's not British. I mean, Rupert Everett was their first and only choice. There yeah. was no option. They, they were like, we literally have to get him otherwise we can't make this movie so i can understand why they would have been like uh but they knew that they couldn't make this movie and have it succeed in italy if they didn't have rupert everett and that was because of his likeness to dylan dog mm -hmm. because italians liked it yes. i honestly didn't know dylan dog was an italian thing which makes sense as to why, like, the movie didn't do very well over here. Well, it's also really strange because the story of Dylan Dog is actually, it takes place in the UK. And his sidekick is a Groucho what? Marx lookalike. Um, it's all very okay. odd. Like, it's such yeah. a confusing origin. And you're just like, weird, weird, weird. And then we got this movie, and it's just so not appropriate for what I think a mainstream audience would be expecting from this film. No. 
it seems like the stars aligned to make the film, but then there seemed to be no chance it would ever be anything more than a cult film. I mean, that's kind of what it is now. Oh, for sure. Yeah. But there are like, people love this movie mm-hmm. and good for them. Well, I'm interested. Okay, so I think one of the reasons that this film has found such a cult following is because it is deeper. It's got a lot more on its mind than your typical zombie film, which we've alluded to now many, many times throughout the last hour. Right. I'm curious to know, what do you think of that back half of the film and particularly the ending, which goes off the deep end into kind of philosophical, you know, existential stuff? It literally goes off the deep end because he comes <laughs> to the end of the world. <laughs> yeah. After driving through a giant tunnel, which is like, hello, symbolism. So I, I did find one reading. I'm in bad trace. I forgot to cite his source. But this one sentence. Uh, so it just says, the Italian citizens who were zombified, uh, a disquietingly fascist troop of Boy Scouts, Buffalora's highest ranking and competent bureaucrat, may represent the dead archetypes of Italian society come back to haunt the living. Mm-hmm. That's where I think there's like a cultural boundary there. But granted, do you want to think that these cultists, uh, cultists, these people who were like in the cult of like Cemetery Man really acknowledge this or recognize this? Maybe some of them do. But I don't think so. I just think there's maybe more on display that maybe like if you lived in Italy or if you were Italian that you would maybe understand and you knew Italian history, you would understand what this movie was doing a little bit more. Yeah, I think you can understand the basic foundations of fashion fascism god yeah. damn it that's a tough word to say I love fascism it. fascism sur- sur- surreal surreality yeah <laughs> fascism and surreality <laughs> i think if you knew more about the historical legacy of the country beyond simply like oh well, i'm pretty sure i know some stuff about history in germany but i don't think that that's actually what the film is working through but there's obviously a classist divide in the way that people with money get treated the way that social conventions get treated mm-hmm. You know, he's very much an outsider, a loner figure. He and Nagi are left alone to do their own bidding. And they're they're essentially tasked with preventing an apocalyptic zombie outbreak. Yeah. And yet nobody seems to fucking care because everybody's no. off, you know, trying to get elected and go on their Boy Scout troop and that kind well, of stuff. I mean, everyone that we come across that's living dies except for that old lady that keeps greeting him at like the town's entrance or something. Yeah, and you may or may not have caught this joke. It depends on how deep your Argento knowledge goes, but Mm -hmm. she keeps referring to him as an engineer. I mean, I caught that, but what was that referring to? So the joke is that there's a film, Deep Red, where there's a guy, I think he's either a caretaker, or he's like kind of a, a lower class citizen, and somebody keeps calling him an engineer. Oh. That's Swazi's, this is my my nod to my mentor. <laughs> yeah, see, that one's not quite as loud. <laughs> uh, if I like Deep Red more, I probably would care. I really watched Deep Red very recently, like in the past like month or two for the first time. And, and I bought the fucking Arrow Blu-ray for like $30. See, I'm surprised that you would, considering you your self-proclaimed dislike for a lot of Italian horror. Because I've heard so many people tell me how good Deep Red is and how amazing Deep Red is. And Blu-ray.com was like, oh, this is a five out of five movie. And I was like, you know what? I'll take that risk. I should know better by now. But yeah, as for the ending, I mean, I don't know. Like the snow globe thing, it's very like uh, St. Elsewhere. I don't know if you like know what that reference is. Mm -hmm. but But you can explain it anyway. I've never watched the show, but I know it's like one of the <laughs> I know it's like one of the most famous, you know, endings of a TV show of all time, basically, where it's like, you know, the show is about whatever it's about. It's a medical drama with Andre Brower, who lots of people now know from Brooklyn Nine Nine and other things. Oh. But uh it was on for like eight or nine seasons, and the final episode revealed that everything that happened throughout the course of the show was actually taking place within an autistic child's snow globe. Like it's like the last like like what, like 30 seconds of the series finale is like where this is revealed Mm -hmm. yeah i can only imagine (laughs) i know it's i think up there with like the dallas bobby reveal in the shower (laughs) oh yeah yeah for sure um god you know what is the closest thing we have to a water cooler show besides game of thrones like do we even have that anymore Mm, i think it's at this point probably just game of thrones yeah yeah um but yeah i mean I, i don't know like clearly the movie's trying to say something you know they're reaching the edge of the world 
and Nagi is able to talk, and then Francesco loses his ability to talk. Mm -hmm. What is it trying to say? I honestly could not tell you. I mean, I'm sure it's something, but I don't know what it is. Again, I think this is an example of you can make the argument for a variety of different interpretations of readings. Yeah. I saw one person suggest that the entire movie, like St. Elsewhere, is actually all taking place in Franco. So Francesco's friend, he's a bureaucrat who... He takes credit for his murders. Yeah, so that seems like a weird development that happens late in the film. But there's a reference earlier that he is having an affair, and then he tries to reason with her. And I think there's even a suggestion that he actually kills his wife, or maybe the mistress that he's having the affair with. Wait, I did want to bring up one quick thing really quick, though, mm -hmm. that I actually did like. The, a character trait of Francesco is that he likes to read the phone book for pleasure. Yes. And he crosses out people as they die. Or maybe he crosses up the living. I don't know. It's one of those things. But there's a part where he re-kills, uh, you know, she, at the final time. And Nagi dumps a bunch of old phone books onto the burning corpse. And he's like, these are the classics. Just because we have new phone books doesn't mean you can just trash the old ones. Mm -hmm. These are classics. <laughs> this is my reading material. <laughs> See, again, I'm laughing. There you go. <laughs> I did enjoy that, though. Yeah, so... This idea that Francesco and Nagi are actually two competing, like, warring parts of Franco's personality. So mm -hmm. Nagi is the happy part where he's content with the lot that he has in life. He's willing to be a bit of a romantic about it, whereas Francesco is the negative, the doom and gloom, the person who focuses on all the bad things. And that's why he ends up going on the killing spree after taking, you know, death's advice to kill yeah. the living instead. Oh, we didn't even mention that death shows up in this movie. <laughs> <laughs> it was in this plot summary trace oh okay i'm sorry you mentioned it but yeah go ahead <laughs> um yes death shows up in the form of well i mean there's a lot of symbolism with both the way that death is depicted in statues but also you know angel wings that show up in silhouette or the way that like shadows fall from different characters and yeah so this idea that Franco is actually comprised of these two characters and that this is all actually happening in his comatose mind. And then at the end, when they go through the tunnel, that's kind of like the awakening moment. They're transporting from one area, like the place that they've been trapped the whole time. And then they get to the other side. And the reason that they switch is Nagi then assumes control and the doom and gloom is kind of dissipated. Like he's found his happy place or maybe died. Yeah. You know what? I will subscribe to that reading. I like that. I mean, it's whatever. Like, I can't imagine I'll watch this movie again anytime soon because <laughs> I watch it twice in 48 hours. <laughs> but no, I mean, I, I can buy into that and that makes sense. I don't know what it says, though, that Nagi is, again, simple minded or slow. Mm -hmm. So is it trying to say that to be happy means you have to, like, be naive and stupid? Whereas, you know, knowledge grants you, like, a doom and gloom, more, quote-unquote, realistic outlook on life. Right. Um, but again, that's where you're going into these philosophical views, you know? And, like, what do you think the movie says about it, you know? Well, it's interesting because as slow or simple-minded as Nagi is, you know, at one point we also see him complete the skull puzzle that has been tormenting oh, yeah. Francesco the entire movie. So. And Francesco can't solve it. I think there's a suggestion that He's smart in other ways, and maybe there's a traditional definition of being able to engage with other people and being linguistic, like being verbal. It's kind of like how, like, um, I mean, I I'm generalizing here, but, like, you know, someone some who has autism is, like, really good at puzzles or languages or, like, like um, think true. words and numbers, you know, but, you know, they're not good with emotions. Right. Call back to our escape room episode. <laughs> yes. <it's, laughs> Patreon episode. Pay us $5 and you can hear it. Uh, <laughs> so, I mean, like, that's kind of like the track that that's going on. Mm -hmm. It's almost like the depiction of magical Negroes and, like, wise indigenous characters where you've got, like, the cube-esque genius character who can't function in the real world, but they can solve problems and do these kinds of things. It's, it's a weird trope. Yeah. So, I don't know. This film lends itself to lots of different interesting interpretations. We haven't really talked at all about the way that it's shot or how it looks visually. I know. <laughs>
I love the shot in the hospital when it zooms out and it looks like a little uh, miniature mm-hmm. uh, or like like a, a diorama of a hospital room. Like yep. that, that was really cool. I love when he's walking down the stairs and you see all the, the mirrors around the spiral and mm-hmm. his interactions with Falchi, I think, are really romantic and striking. Like they look almost like paintings. Yeah, I can see that. But then also there's like a lot of it that's just shot very plainly. Like there's not a lot of style in the way it's shot other than like those handful of scenes for me. Hmm. Okay. I mean, you could disagree, which is fine. But <laughs> I, I'm thinking about like, like the scene when like, you know, Nagi throws up on Valentina and it's just, oh, it's just seen out in a, I guess maybe there's a lot of um like swivel, like the camera swirls around a lot. Yeah. But I don't know. I don't know. I was really taken with the aesthetic. I'd be interested to hear from people who consider themselves fans of the film to see if that's one of the things that they connect with really strongly. Because I think it does have a very distinctive visual look to it that particularly in like 94 to 96 when this film was being released, I don't know that we were getting that in our horror movies and certainly not our zombie films. Well, and that's kind of what makes it more all the more upsetting, I guess, that this movie wasn't welcomed with warmer arms i don't (laughs) didn't receive a warmer welcome there you go there we go um (laughs) because yeah i mean like it there's a lot here and also again it's a gay man in the the lead role Mm -hmm. and it does shit which i'm sure hollywood was like oh never gonna hire him again yeah unless we need a gay best friend (laughs) which he again 1997 and he is great in My Best Friend's Wedding. If you've never seen it, this is not the podcast for it, but uh, go see it. It's great. Yeah, sure. Go see it. <laughs> Buy it. <laughs> not my favorite. Julia Roberts and I are like hot and cold. Wait, wait, wait. Not your favorite? Seriously? Yeah. Oh, my God. That movie is like one of the best rom- like non-rom-coms ever. Yeah. It's and she fine. doesn't even. Well, sorry. Spoiler alert. She doesn't even get the guy. <laughs> Yeah, I will give a credit for that. I think there's only like two romantic comedies that I've seen where they don't end up together. And I do appreciate that. But also, My Best Friend's Wedding is kind of a horror movie. You know what? Maybe we'll cover it one day. It's a horror movie in its own right. No, no, no. Because she is a psychopath. Oh, yeah. Her character is a psychopath in that movie. (laughs) She's like a stalker. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) And she makes terrible, like, awful... uh, Anyway, sorry. And not in My Best Friend's Wedding podcast. We'll just be like all the other horror podcasts and we'll do it for like a Valentine's Day episode. Yes. I mean, honestly, it could work. We'll pair it with Audition. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my God. Was there anything else you wanted to, like, really touch on with the film? I mean, again, there's a lot to unpack with this film. And, like, we, what, we've been going for probably, like, a little over an hour, maybe hour, 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. And we have not touched everything. It's not possible. No. So, before we, I guess, throw it to the the listeners to see what they want to bring up, is there anything else you want to discuss? Not so much discuss as kind of an advisement. So I know that we have younger listeners and that sometimes people tell us that they do seek out the films that they haven't seen because they know that we're covering it on the podcast. So I would Mm -hmm. say that if you're falling into maybe either of those two categories that you go into this film not expecting it to be like a regular zombie film, but also... I mean, if it doesn't work for you, it doesn't work for you. But I do honestly think that this is a kind of film that you need to see twice to really let it sink in. Yeah. Which I mean, is maybe I, I would unfair agree to that. ask of people, but. Well, no, no, no. And I mean, I, I, I also think a discussion like what we just had. I'm not saying I'm giving this movie a three, but like I've <laughs> I've grown to appreciate a little bit more after discussing it for what it is. I mean, I've watched it twice in 24 hours. We just had an over hour long discussion about it. I doubt anyone is listening to this that hasn't seen it or at least made it this far into the episode that hasn't seen it yet but if you have that's awesome go seek this movie out and let us know what you think yeah and if you do like this movie or has been one of your favorites for a long time what do you like about it what do you think of rupert everett and uh his inability to get you know male lead roles after 1989 wah, wah. and yeah i mean like do you like this movie do you like dead alive yeah do you like them titties yeah do you like them, uh, the, them epic tatas or what was it? What was it? The, the, the awesome knockers yeah. of Anna Fauci. 
The melons? Jesus Christ. Oh my god, those melon shots. Also, oh, and if you're straight, what do you call breasts mid-coitus? No. Do you call them, <laughs> do you call them tits? Do you call them knockers? Do you call them melons? <laughs> like, do you say, let me suck on your melons? Is that what you do? I, I'm really interested. Wait, wait, wait. Let's make sure that this is equal opportunity then. So, ladies and gays, do you then have pet names for penises that you like to reference? Do you call no, no, them no. fuck sticks? I don't even mean pet names. I mean, like, all right, when I'm drunk, I actually tend to ask people this, specifically straight people. Because, all right, I'm actually really curious. But like, all right, <laughs> I don't like the word pussy. I think it's a gross word. I think I've just said this on the podcast before. But um, I'm always curious to know what people call a vagina, like, when they're having sex. Because I'm like, well, you don't really call it a vagina. You don't say, like, let me eat your vagina. Let me fuck your vagina. I talked to a girl recently who was like, no, I just say eat me. Like, fuck me. Like, it's not my vagina. It's me. I was like, okay, that makes sense. But what do you say? And also for gay men, do you, I'm pretty sure most gay men ascribe, subscribe to the word cock. Probably. Like mid sex. I mean, pussy and cock are probably the default resting. But... I just can't imagine. I mean, again, like I haven't had sex with a woman, but I just can't imagine saying pussy. Can't imagine that. All right. So apparently, we are we are opening up the uh, <laughs> the Twitter messages to some potentially profane language, but hit yes. us with it. Yeah, no, let us know. What do you call your significant others or hookups or whatever's sexual parts, uh, genitalia or breasts? Because they're not genitalia. <laughs> and I don't know how we got onto that subject with this movie. Oh, you can thank those wonderful men who left these awful, creepy <laughs> reviews <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> about Anna Fauci's boobs. <laughs> Jesus, poor woman. A poor woman. I'm sure she's, she's like, like, I'm going into acting because I want something more challenging. Cue sexualized <laughs> reviews. Yay. She's reading these reviews like, what's a knocker? <laughs> um, but yeah, let us know what you think about this movie. I don't really have any homework for you besides the aforementioned um, sexual topic. And anything on your end? No. Okay. Well, um, before we announce what we're covering next week, if you want to reach us on Twitter, you can reach me at Trace Thurman. I'm at B Stole My Remote. That's the letter B. And if you're tweeting about the podcast, please be sure to use the hashtag HorrorQueers in your tweets. Or you can email us at HorrorQueers at gmail.com. But if you do have two seconds, please head on over to iTunes and leave us a rating. Literally all that entails is just pressing a button, pressing one of the stars, preferably the five-star button. But if you have 30 seconds, you can leave us a rating and a review, meaning you press that five-star button and you also like write a sentence about how we're hopefully great. Mm -hmm. Super easy. Just go to your Apple Podcasts app and do that. If you like what you've listened to and you want even more content, please visit our Patreon page at patreon.com backslash horrorqueers, where you can sign up for exclusive bonus episodes each month. Now remember, you have to use the link. We won't show up in the Patreon search engine because we use naughty language. As evidenced by the last 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly. This bonus content will consist of uh, full-length episode reviews of new horror films, mini-sodes, and some other fun stuff like newsletters, which everyone loves a good newsletter. We've got episodes on Pet Cemetery and the Chris of La Llorona in there already, but next month, uh, aka May, we'll have an episode on The Perfection, as well as a mystery film that our $5 Patreon patrons will be voting on. Uh, but of course, obviously, if you become a patron, you also have access to all of our exclusive content that we've already released. And on that note, what are we covering next week for the regular people, Joe? Okay, so on the main feed, we're sticking with really high class, really cerebral horror. We're really going to be getting into it. You know, it's an art house director in Neil Butte, And, oh, fuck it. I can't even, I just can't keep up the pretense. So we're watching the goddamn remake of Wicker Man with Nicolas Cage. <laughs> hey, okay, I'm surprised. We're doing Cemetery Man this week, and we're doing The Wicker Man next week. I'm surprised you didn't pull, like, a whole, oh, like, we're moving from the cemetery to the Wicker Man. Do you even hear yourself as you said that, though? I thought it was kind of clever, but, you know. Maybe it's your sense of humor isn't palatable to Canadians. <laughs> <I know>. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, so, uh, yeah, we are going into camp. Well... I've only seen this movie once. and The bees! The bees! The bees! The bees! We are moving into full-time camp territory. Uh, Nicolas Cage shouting about bees, wearing a bear suit, punching ladies. Kicking them, riding a bicycle. My Blu-ray has a Lily Sobieski commentary, and I'm quite <gasps> curious about it. Oh my god. <laughs> Do you think she's going to be like, yeah, the craft services this day was really good. They served melon. I don't know! <laughs> but I'm so excited. Jesus. 
glasses. <laughs> oh my god. And uh, we're actually not going to be doing this one alone either. We've got a very special guest star, but we're keeping it yes. quiet. We are keeping that quiet. So tune in next week. For this week, we can cross out Cemetery Man. Yeah, and cross out Horror Queers. <laughs> Get in, losers. This is the Lady Killers, a feminine rage podcast. I'm Jen. I'm Sammy. I'm Rocco. And I'm May. Our podcast is a tribute to the female identifying killers in horror and more. Each episode will feature us, your Supreme Court of female murderers, discussing our favorite lady killers from your Julias and Jennifers to your Carries and Christines. We'll tell her story, decide if it's good for her horror, and answer the most important question of all. Would we die for her? Join us on Thursdays as we pull on our sweaters, snatch our ice picks, sharpen our scissors, and honor the lady killers who live on the silver screen. No boys were harmed in the making of this podcast. Yet. Hello, I'm Shelby Scott, the host of Scare You to Sleep, a podcast where I tell you spooky bedtime stories full of creepy sound effects and music that is soothing yet unsettling to help immerse you into a world of horror. This is a show for those of us who have realized horror can be a strange but relaxing escape from reality. Speaking of escapes, sometimes I lead you through guided nightmares like a guided meditation, but instead of flowery meadows, I take you on a journey through your own personal nightmare. So come get lost in the terror with me. Listen to Scare You to Sleep wherever you listen to podcasts or find us online at bloody.fm. Sweet screams.